Such pictures are rare. It's 1909, and Leopold II, King of the Belgians, is watching a bicycle race. He reigns over one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. An ambitious and adventurous monarch, he will turn his country into a modern state. Under his reign, Brussels will be adorned with boulevards and palaces. He will also be the father of Congolese colonization. At the end of the 19th century, a great state had to have colonies to add to its wealth and influence. The great European powers were already in evidence throughout the African continent. Leopold II became the owner, in his own right, of a vast tract of virgin territory in the heart of Africa, having financed the expedition of the Anglo-American explorer, Stanley. These pictures, filmed by a Belgian colonist in the first half of the 20th century, reveal the splendors of this land. Its surface is rich in exceptional flora and fauna. Its inhabitants are divided into various tribes. Bantu, Bakongo, Baluba, Pygmies. Hundreds of others live on the territory of the Congo. Its soil conceals gold, copper, cobalt, diamonds. Uranium had not as yet been discovered. In 1908, King Leopold II, the Congo having cost him his fortune, bequeathed his African possessions to the Belgian state. The Belgian Congo was born, its surface area 80 times greater than that of Belgium. The Belgian system of colonization was step by step. Economic development was the first step a major river port, and roads and railroads that are regularly modernized would open the country to the outside world. The motor car would make its appearance in the bush. Fairly soon, domestic air links were being set up throughout the Congo. In 1925, at the behest of King Albert, the inaugural flight was arranged between the capital and the Belgian colony. Lieutenant Edmond Thieffry in the bowler hat and the pilot Leopold Roger and the mechanic Jeff de Breker would attempt this odyssey. A journey which today takes only a few hours lasted 51 days. They arrived at Leopoldville, capital of the Congo, after 14 stages and more than 75 hours in flight. An epic indeed. But in general, the Belgians who tried the colonial adventure left the greyness of their capital by the maritime route. After a voyage of several weeks, the first contact with the colony was made at the port of Matadi, before plunging into the traditions and customs of the African continent. Exploiting abundant cheap labor made the fortunes of many Belgian entrepreneurs. The growing of latex, coffee or cotton was strongly encouraged. Teaching was an important aspect of Belgian colonization. 
the missionary fathers of various religious orders participated in this educational work among the black children. Belgian colonization sought to inculcate in the minds of the Congolese Western values and culture to the detriment of the very fundamentals of African society. Christmas and Carnival became Congolese costume parties. At school, the children learned to disguise themselves as historic Belgians instead of their African forefathers. To finance the heavy investment in Africa, what better than the lure of easy money? The Belgian state set up a national game of chance, the Colonial Lottery. The Second World War was a turning point in the relationship between colonizer and colonized. The news of a Belgian invaded and occupied was to severely dent the myth of the invincible white colonial among the black population. The United Nations organization, which was set up in the aftermath of the war, was clearly anti-colonial and supported the independence movements. Asia was the first to benefit from this wind of change, and countries like the Philippines, Indochina, and Gandhi's India rapidly won their independence and international recognition. As for Africa, it remained largely untouched by this trend to decolonization. The Belgian state had no immediate plans to withdraw from the Congo. And it's undeniable that Belgian colonization had achieved much success. Belgium ran the Congo responsibly and well. The black population had access to a free health service and good elementary education. Belgian newsreels of the day constantly featured the beneficial effects of the colonial presence in Africa. A centre de pédiatrie est ouvert par la Croix Rouge dans la cité indigène de Léopoldville. Des infirmières indigènes veillent sur les bébés noirs qui trouvent au nouveau centre pédiatrique les mêmes soins que dans nos meilleures cliniques. L'hélicoptère sert au Congo belge à la lutte contre la malaria. Les services sanitaires de la colonie n'hésitent jamais à recourir aux moyens d'envergure pour améliorer sans cesse les conditions de salubrité. The Belgians were rather proud of their colony. It was generally recognized that in terms of health, the Congolese had made significant advances. Cholera, malaria, even leprosy were on the wane. In the 1950s, a series of public works brought electricity to the major urban centers. Electric light was reaching even into native shacks. Public housing had been built all over the territory. However, this building program did not enable the colonial administration to eliminate the shanty towns on the outskirts of major cities. Even if the segregation that existed had not the aggressive character of South African style apartheid, in the big cities, the separation of blacks and whites was a daily reality. Africans had no access to first-class compartments and trains, to European schools, or to certain shops. Every day, a curfew was imposed in the black districts. Much of the European population in the cities had only fleeting contact with the native population. They lived in special districts set aside for them. A luxury villa, servants, cars, such were the outward signs of success for the Belgian colonist.
In the bush, life for Peace Corps volunteers was very different. Some still lived like the early colonists and had only rare contact with other whites. En pleine brousse congolaise, le gouvernement général de la colonie fait enregistrer les chants folkloriques menacés de disparition. Les chants indigènes sont doublement intéressants du point de vue musical et par leur caractère ethnologique. Even if attitudes evolved a little over time, and white children and black children sometimes played together, the Belgians continued to think of the Congolese population as big, backward adolescents. Once again, contemporary news reports prove the point. En tournée au Congo, un cirque belge initie les Noirs au mystère des cracheurs de feu. Les braves Congolais ne sont pas loin de croire à une sorcellerie plus formidable que toutes celles qu'ils ont connues. Leurs sorciers n'ont jamais réussi pareille magie. The Belgian administration did not hesitate to exhibit these noble savages in a variety of manifestations. Des villages indigènes caractéristiques ont été reconstitués pour servir de cadre à une mise en valeur des artisanats locaux. C'est ainsi que l'on voit au travail des forgerons, des décorateurs, des potiers indigènes. L'atmosphère ne serait pas authentique sans un peu de sorcellerie. Et les tam-tams sont forcément de la danse. One of the backbones of Belgian-style colonialism was the native army. Commonly known as the force publique and doubling as the police, it was founded during the reign of Leopold II. These Congolese troops distinguished themselves in several battles of the two world wars. All the senior ranks were held by white officers. The Congolese settled for secondary roles. In 1955, Baudouin, the King of the Belgians, visited the Congo. In spite of his obvious stiffness and awkwardness, the young monarch transformed his trip into a plebiscite for the Belgian colonist. The black population nicknamed him Buona Kitoko and gave him a tumultuous welcome. The success of this visit reassured the colonists about their future. The Congo would remain Belgian for many years yet. Journalists returned from this royal visit with pictures that were to fascinate Belgian audiences. The cinemas were packed. Les Wagenia offrent un spectacle de choix aux souverains. Le roi prend des photos personnelles de ses admirables athlètes Wagenia. Ils doivent leur stature magnifique et leur habileté consommée de pagayeurs aux rudes métiers de pêcheurs qu'ils exercent de temps immémorial dans les rapides du fleuve Congo. In his speech, the king expressed the permanence of Belgian colonization thus. My father raised me in the belief that Belgium and the Congo are one nation. And this principle requires the sovereign to ensure the integrity of both territories and to take care of the prosperity as well as the happiness of their peoples. The Belgians often showed precious little interest in their colony. The colonial minister regularly strove to convince them that the Congo was largely responsible for Belgian prosperity. Tous les foyers belges, indistinctement, sont tributaires et bénéficiaires du Congo à leur insu trop souvent. Mains travailleurs belges seraient plutôt surpris d'apprendre que sans le Congo, ils gagneraient moins, dépenseraient plus. Le Congo serait donc autre chose que danse et tam-tam. The incredible resources of the Congo arrived daily at the port of Antwerp. The 
arrival in Belgium of timber, palm oil, coffee, rubber, diamonds, cocoa, steel or cotton enabled many sectors of the Belgian economy to flourish. It was in Belgium that the embryonic idea of independence first saw the light of day. In 1956, a specialist in the African question published an essay in which he suggested a timetable of 30 years for the Congo to set up its own independent constitution. Jeff Van Bilsen, the author of this book, was to start a controversy that would shake the entire country. The Minister for the Colonies set up musical information sessions to enable the Congolese to carry out their first electoral duty. Gradually, a movement towards giving minor responsibilities to certain hand-picked Congolese began to make itself felt. In 1957, elections were organized in the big cities. Only nine Congolese were authorized to represent their own people in the Council of Leopoldville, and a few blacks were elected mayors. Until then, even the Congolese elite seemed hesitant to take their destiny in hand, or even to sketch out the basis of a political philosophy. A long courrier amène du Congo à l'aéroport national 24 évolués indigènes de la colonie et du Rwanda Urundi. Les évolués congolais vont passer un mois en Belgique. Leur séjour permettra l'étude synoptique de la mère patrie et de ses institutions civilisatrices. These so-called evolved natives were Congolese who had obtained a certificate for civil merit. They had to be able to read, write, and above all to justify their sincere desire to reach a more advanced level of civilization. The existence of armchairs or a bed in the home of an applicant or his ability to use cutlery were among the criteria set by the inspectors in charge of selection. These 13 visitors were evolved natives who in 1956 had received exceptional authorization to go to Belgium. The first major surprise for these blacks who set foot on the national territory was to discover that whites could do domestic chores jobs which in the Congo were done exclusively by blacks. For their part, the Belgians, meeting these visitors from the Congo, were surprised to find people with good manners and polite conversation. Among these visitors to the mother country was a certain Patrice Lumumba. During the Universal Exhibition held in Brussels in 1958, one pavilion was entirely devoted to the Congo. For this occasion, it was not a mere handful of selected people, but hundreds of Congolese who would come to Brussels. This exhibition, which was supposed to be a shop window for the triumph of colonialism, would instead be transformed into a catalyst for aspiration to decolonization. The Africans returned to the Congo changed men. They now expressed themselves more freely, and many had made friends among the Belgians. In August 1958, on the other side of the Congo River, General de Gaulle, on a visit to Brazzaville, offered the French colonies of black Africa the choice of independence. Such a proposition, made at the doors of the Congolese capital, could only inflame tempers. The same year, Patrice Lumumba, one of the evolved natives, founded one of the first Congolese political parties, the Congolese National Movement, or MNC and the animator of a cultural group called Abaco, Joseph Casavubu, also became active in politics. These groups expressed their desire for greater autonomy for the indigenous people. 
their ideas were winning increasing popular support. In 1959, the dispersal of an Abaco meeting quickly degenerated into a bloody insurrection. The whites were also manhandled and became extremely worried. Calm was restored only after a severe repression led by the Fosse Publique over several days. Kasavubu was arrested. 42 Congolese were killed. The aftershock was significant. Belgians, both in the mother country and the colony, who had not read the signals, were shaken. They procrastinated. In a message, the king promised in a rather unspecific way to lead the Congolese people to independence. The minister for the colonies was no more precise in his statement to the parliament. The séance historique au Parlement belge. Au nom du gouvernement, le ministre Van Emelrijk prend l'engagement solennel de doter le Congo d'institutions démocratiques nouvelles, d'instituer le statut unique pour blancs et noirs et d'élever le niveau de vie général dans l'intérêt des deux pays associés. Cette politique reçoit l'adhésion des trois partis nationaux. Throughout 1959, tension remained high everywhere in the Congo. At Kasai, the Luwala and Baluba tribes began killing each other. Lumumba was arrested for incitement to racial hatred at a meeting where he called for independence, immediate and unconditional. The colonial authorities, confused, blamed the climate of revolt that reigned in the Congo on the high unemployment among the natives. The administration tried to get the unemployed back to work, but nothing doing. More and more, the Congolese were demanding an acceleration of the process leading to independence. The Belgian authorities decided to organize in Brussels a Belgo-Congolese round table to get the process of decolonization underway. The Congolese refused to take part without the leader of the MNC. Patrice Lumumba was released from prison and flown urgently to Brussels. He arrived on the 26th of January 1960 and joined the round table to the great delight of his partisans. major Congolese leaders took part in this unprecedented meeting. In spite of considerable dissent on the structure of the future Congolese state, the Africans presented a united front to the Belgian delegation. Everything happened very quickly. The independence of the Congo was fixed for the 30th of June 1960. This timetable of a few months was extremely tight. A whole country had to be organized using limited resources. In a country where the native people had been confined to subordinate jobs, a government had to be set up, a parliament, a judiciary, a civil service. The whites had kept all the positions of authority and the Congo in 1960 had only 20 university graduates. Elections were organized with some urgency. Grand jour d'élection au Congo. À Léopoldville, les électeurs se pressaient de bon matin en longue file devant les bureaux de vote. Les bulletins se distinguent des nôtres en ce qu'ils portent les photos des candidats, mesures destinées à faciliter le choix des analphabètes. Dans un mois, ce sera l'indépendance et l'apprentissage de la démocratie. Patrice Lumumba's MNC party won the vote ahead of Joseph Kasavubu's Abako. To decide who would lead the new Congolese state, parliamentary elections were organized. Finally, it was Joseph Kasavubu who would become president of the Congo. After intense discussions, the newly elected delegates chose Patrice Lumumba to lead the first Congolese government. 
but tensions were already simmering between the new prime minister and his ministerial colleagues. A song called Independence Chacha was the hit record of this eve of independence. King Baudouin made the trip to the Congo for the festivities to celebrate independence. The smiles give no hint of the coming storm, which would be a turning point in Belgo-Congolese relations. King Baudouin was the first to speak. L'indépendance du Congo constitue l'aboutissement de l'œuvre conçue par le génie du roi Léopold II, entreprise par lui avec un courage tenace et continuée avec persévérance par la Belgique. Following this commemoration of the colonial achievement, Joseph Kassavubu diplomatically expressed his gratitude to the Belgian state. But Patrice Lumumba's speech was a bolt from the blue. We have known the ironies, the insults, the coups that we had to do in the morning, midi and evening, because we were the nerfs, who would forget that when a noir was not able to be not just as an enemy, but because the name of the honorable was reserved for the black. This speech froze the atmosphere. The accords to mark independence were duly signed, but a serious diplomatic clash had been narrowly avoided. The festivities that followed this ceremony were not to last long. They would soon give way to bloodshed. On July 4th, the Force Publique mutinied. Most of the ranks of officers and sub-officers were still held by whites. Disaffected Congolese NCOs called for civil disobedience and terrible riots ensued. In a few days, retribution was rife throughout the country. The black people were the first victims of this violence which caused numerous deaths. Then the Congolese soldiers also turned on the whites. The army was responsible for rape and pillage in several European enclaves and districts, especially at Kisville. News of these atrocities spread, causing panic. The white people fled, their main aim now to escape this young African state. Belgium was shaken by the sheer scale of events and the distress of its citizens. The government decided to send reinforcements to the Congo and to mobilize its troops already stationed there. Belgian Paris launched a massive intervention. Initially, they tried to restore order and reassure the terrified Belgian colonists. Later, they tried to protect Belgian interests in the Congo. Patrice Lumumba was unable to restore order. The unrest was spreading. He would not accept this military intervention by Belgium. He accused Belgium of engaging in an act of aggression against its former colony. He insisted that the Belgian soldiers leave the Congo and that their place be taken by the blue helmets of the UNO. At the UN Security Council, in answer to a question from the Congolese minister Kenza, the Belgian minister Vigny lectured his opposite number like a teacher scolding a child. Session dramatique à l'ONU. 
Le ministre Kanza accuse la Belgique d'agression et réclame le retrait immédiat des troupes belges. Le ministre Vigny s'indigne. Monsieur Kanza, voyez-vous que si nous avions préparé des complots ou des agressions, nous aurions été de tels traîtres et de tels gens sans honneur vis-à-vis -vis de nos femmes, de nos filles, de nos fillettes, pour les laisser dans un, dé, dans un enfer pareil. Belgium was not condemned by the UN, but was asked to withdraw its troops quickly. It would comply at least partly over the weeks that followed. Belgian paras were replaced by UN troops charged with restoring calm throughout the country. The peacekeepers were welcomed by a Congolese people still shaken by the tragic events they had just experienced. The secession of Katanga would further accentuate the troubles afflicting the fledgling Congolese state. Katanga was one of the Congo's richest regions. Moïse Chombe, the leader of this province, opposed the creation of a centralized Congolese state. And on the 11th July 1960, he proclaimed the secession of Katanga province. Chombe, now its president, organized the defense of the region. The Katangese gendarmerie was made up of volunteers and mercenaries. This dissidence was soon followed by South Kasai. On the 8th of August, Kalonji, the strongman of this rich province, took the initiative of withdrawing Kasai from the central Congolese state. He also prepared the defense of his region. Patrice Lumumba and the UN commanders did not want to see these rich provinces detaching themselves from the Congo. The financial backing of Katanga and Kasai was fundamental if the independence of the new Congolese state was to be confirmed. Stripped of the support of UN troops, Lumumba nevertheless decided to use the army to put down both secessions. This offensive would end in blood and failure its first victim, the civil populace of Kasai province. Discord was also growing between the two heads of the Congolese executive, Lumumba and Kasavubu, whom we see together for the last time in these pictures, had more and more points of disagreement. In September 1960, Kasavubu issued an order for the arrest of Lumumba. In his turn, Lumumba declared himself head of state. The Congo was being run by two men at loggerheads in a climate of confusion. With the backing of the army, Colonel Mobutu decided to put an end to the chaos that plagued the Congo. Mobutu Sese Seko succeeded in neutralizing the two adversaries and restoring a certain calm across the country. Only 30 years old, this former Secretary of State in Lumumba's government gave the power to a college of general administrators made up of university graduates called back from Europe. Mobutu accused Lumumba of contacts with the communist regimes of Eastern Europe. Under house arrest, the Prime Minister managed to escape, but soon after he was re-arrested by the army. These are the last pictures of Patrice Lumumba. Under the eyes of Mobutu and the camera lens, the former Prime Minister is manhandled. He was sent to Katanga in January 1961, the land of his worst enemies, and there tortured and murdered. The Belgian state, the Katangese, Mobutu's men, the USA, even the UN, all are regularly mentioned in connection with his death. Lumumba was to become the figurehead of all those who fight against imperialism. Even at the time, Belgium was accused of having ordered his assassination. In the days that followed the revelation of his death, there were demonstrations in Moscow, Belgrade, London and Cairo. 
In some capital cities, demonstrators attacked the Belgian embassy. The UN was also a theater of Congolese demonstrations. C'est dans ce contexte qu'à New York, le Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU va devoir se prononcer sur la motion du délégué soviétique, le retrait du Congo des troupes de l'ONU et la prise de sanctions contre la Belgique. Tandis que le délégué américain Adlai Stevenson réfute cette thèse, l'hémicycle est envahi par des protestataires. Tumulte sans exemple à l'ONU. Despite numerous attempts at conciliation by the UN, the conflict raged on in Katanga. UN troops were sent to the province and authorized to use force to try and contain Chombe. This time, it was war. Katengi's resistance was vigorous, and UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld had to call for a ceasefire. Given the heavy losses suffered by the Blue Helmets, the man nicknamed Monsieur H decided to go there in person to negotiate. He would never arrive. His plane crashed en route. An assassination attempt was suspected, but the UN report concluded it was an accident. After agreement was reached, the conflict flared up anew at the end of 1961. Finally, Katanga was entirely taken over by UN forces and calm was restored throughout the province. At the end of 1963, accords were signed between the Katangan authorities and UN representatives for the dissident province to be reintegrated into the Congo, Moïse Chombe was forced into exile. The 1964 was bloody throughout the Congo. Kasavubu, president once more, and the central government at Leopoldville had great difficulty asserting their authority. Two rebellions broke out simultaneously. Mulele, head of a group of communist rebels, sowed terror in the province of Leopoldville. The disruption was total, despite a counterattack by the National Army. In the east, within three months, rebels known as Simbas had taken over half the Congo. These fighters, many no more than boys, believed themselves invincible, protected by magic. They sowed terror throughout the territories they had conquered. The entire region was plunged into a bloodbath. The Congolese state was unable to put down the rebellion and asked for the support of Belgian troops. Belgian Paris, with the help of mercenaries, forced the Simbas back into the forest. However, they arrived too late to prevent the massacre of Westerners at Stanleyville. During this war, the rebels killed around 8,000 people in that town. At the head of the Congolese state, the personalities came and went. Joseph Kasabubu called Moïse Chombe back from exile to try to re-establish order. Chombe's popularity was very high and his return to Leopoldville triumphant. He failed in his attempt to overthrow Kasavubu and was forced back into exile. The president himself would be relieved of his duties shortly afterwards in a coup d'etat led by the military. In 1965, the head of the army, Mobutu, took the reins of power. To restore calm, he declared a state of emergency in a country which in five years had seen more than half a million victims. From this date onward, for over 30 years, 
The history of the Congo would be linked with that of one man, Mobutu. He held all the power, legislative, executive, and judicial. In 1970, Mobutu declared himself the only candidate for the presidency of the republic. Congolese newsreels of the day retraced the countrywide campaign of the sole candidate at the elections. Quant au président Mobutu, il refaisait une fois de plus la longue route fluviale avec toutes ses escales déferlantes d'enthousiasme populaire pour sa personne. Il allait ouvrir ce qu'il faut bien dénommer la campagne électorale pour la présidence de la République et les législatives. De jour comme de nuit et dans les moindres bourgades, le paradoxe fut qu'il devrait non pas démontrer ses titres aux fonctions suprêmes, mais persuader d'abord les citoyennes et citoyens de l'utilité d'élire démocratiquement le chef de l'État. Porté au pouvoir par l'armée, cinq ans plus tôt, il pouvait apparaître aux yeux de l'étranger comme un chef imposé sans assise populaire. Appréciation absurde pour les Congolais, car dans les huit provinces de l'immense pays, où qu'il aille, les foules enthousiastes se pressent autour du président Mobutu, qu'elle proclame le père de la patrie. Formule romantique, non, réalité concrète. He would be elected with an absolute majority to the post of president, to be renewed in 1977 and 1984. He would take the oath of office a few months after his plebiscite. Moi, Joseph Désiré Mobutu, élu président de la République démocratique du Congo, je jure d'observer la Constitution et les lois de la République de maintenir l'indépendance nationale et l'intégrité du territoire. To be sure of holding on to power, he set out to suppress the slightest opposition. Anyone who tried to organize an opposition to Mobutu's regime was tried and generally eliminated. Power was held by the only authorized party, and Mobutu was its founder. The PRM, or Popular Revolution Movement, had influence in every aspect of Congolese life and ensured the spread of what came to be called Mobutism. A vast propaganda machine was put in place to reach all layers of society. Newsreels and television constantly featured the benevolent works of the president. Landmarks of the president's life and those close to him filled hours of national television. The young state needed to fashion a history for itself, and its president set out to create an entire mythology around himself and his country. Notre jeune président a 38 ans. Cet anniversaire fêté en compagnie de Madame Mobutu fut l'occasion pour tous d'exprimer au chef de l'État l'admiration et la gratitude de chacun de nos concitoyens. Car depuis huit ans, le nom de Joseph Désiré Mobutu est indissolublement lié à toutes les péripéties de la vie nationale depuis la naissance de l'État congolais le 30 juin 60. À 30 ans, le jeune colonel Mobutu avait la lourde tâche de constituer notre armée nationale. Il en a fait le creuset de l'unité nationale. Avec elle, il a mis fin aux rébellions, à la politicaille et est restauré l'autorité suprême de l'État, dont il est l'expression depuis le 24 novembre 65. Avec le MPR, il a doté la nation des cadres qui lui manquaient. Tout cela couronné par la réalité effective de notre indépendance économique et par la restauration du prestige congolais à travers le monde.
Mobutu did not hesitate to hijack the myth of Lumumba. Rumor might link Mobutu with the assassination of the former leader, but his was a legend too powerful to ignore. In Israel, Yugoslavia, Romania, Egypt, China, Formosa, Japan, Germany or Greece, Mobutu was always ready to represent his country abroad. In this Cold War period, he was a precious ally that many countries were happy to cultivate. The Americans generously supported a leader whose anti-communism was well known. On several occasions, the strong man of the Congo was received in the White House with full official honors. France also featured prominently among his supporters. Its government would not hesitate to intervene militarily to sustain the ruling power in the Congo. With Belgium, Mobutu would always have a love-hate relationship. Diplomatic relations between the two blew hot and cold, even though there was a deep bond of friendship between the general and the king of the Belgians. The two men, who were the same age, had great respect for each other. At home, Mobutu tried to revive an economy which had been badly weakened in five years of Congolese chaos. Everything had to be rebuilt. The Westerners had fled this unstable country. The infrastructure and the workforce had been badly damaged by incessant conflict. At first, the general could point to a number of successes. Foreign investors helped reintegrate a country for which comparative stability was enough. Industry was concentrated in the regions of Leopoldville and Shaba. A policy of civil works aimed to give the country a modern infrastructure. Some projects, however, did more for the leader's megalomania than for the public interest. The road network, for example, remained in a ruinous state and largely contributed to the economic malaise of this vast country. Little by little, agriculture was recovering. A policy of agricultural training and supervision was introduced, along with changes to growing methods. Production increased across several sectors. The propaganda claimed that this reorganization enabled agriculture to meet the needs of all the people, but this did not take account of the huge population increases. Life in the countryside remained difficult. Yet the soil of the Congo still yielded up incredible mineral riches that were coveted by many. Exports in this sector, especially of copper, were the basis of the country's currency revenues. Above all, Mobutism was marked by a quest for authenticity. It was this that drove the general to banish from his country any remaining traces of colonialism. He preached Africanization of people, villages, rivers. Congo became Zaire, Leopoldville, Kinshasa, Elizabethville, Lumumbashi, and Stanleyville, Kisangani. Zairianization translated into nationalization of foreign businesses for distribution to Zairian citizens. It meant that Mobutu could reward all those loyal to him, but the policy was a total failure. The newly created businessmen proved incapable of managing their companies, and the state had to reverse its policy. Corruption was rife. In Zaire, everything was for sale. Teachers, civil servants, doctors made whatever they could out of the people. 
In the same way, the general president and his cronies drew on the state budget to build huge fortunes for themselves. In fact, the national economy was a bottomless pit and the country one of the most indebted in the world. The basic services of the state could no longer be relied upon. While life in the presidential palaces became ever more luxurious, in the countryside the situation was deteriorating rapidly. The peasants survived thanks mainly to subsistence farming and barter. Malnutrition was widespread and diseases which had disappeared before 1960 now made a comeback. Despite some attempts at democratization, Mobutu, who had proclaimed himself marshal, still clung to power. Rebellion was breaking out everywhere and the state was having more and more trouble putting it down. The end of the Cold War had made the general an embarrassment rather than an ally for Western democracies. External support for the regime was ebbing away. In 1997, an armed revolt in the East drove Mobutu, now a sick man, into exile, where he died soon after. In an ironical twist of fate, a final snub to the disgraced president, the rebels renamed Zaire, Congo.